to the show and thanks for taking the time to check us out. Doug Cosmo Clifford is here today, and I believe he's the first musician I've had on the show who is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That's pretty a big that's a pretty big accomplishment right there. And he, of course, was part of Creedence Clearwater Revival, one of the greatest rock bands of all time. And then he went on to form Creedence Clearwater Revisited with the bass player Stu Cook, and that lasted 25 years. And now he's got a new project out called Clifford Wright that he will tell us all about. And he's got a lot of great stories from the old days and some sad memories as well. And I really enjoyed chatting with Doug and I loved hearing all these stories. Um, I do, however, want to preface this, the, the interview, that he is 76 years old and he's had some health issues, which he's very upfront about. He has Parkinson's disease. So if he struggles at times in this interview, uh, just be patient with him because again he's really got some great stories and some great insight and he's made some great music and he's going to tell you all about it so here we go welcome doug cosmo clifford uh how are you doing i'm doing great and you great just it's hot in uh, scottsdale here but uh i understand that you have a place down here as well you're in reno now but you go back and forth that's uh, true. We spend four months. We spend virtually. We spend winter. I'm uh, in the mountains here at six thousand foot elevation. I've uh, shoveled snow for forty years, and uh, uh, I love Arizona in the winter. Right. It's you can't. And it might be the best place in the country, if not the world, in the winter. I think. I, I agree. Yeah. So tell me about this new project, um, or I can tell the audience a little bit. I mean, I, know I listened. I think it's great. It's, is it, it's called Clifford slash Wright. Is that, that what you're titling it? That, that, that's correct. Uh, uh, the, the right part of it is uh, Steve Wright from uh, Great Ken, uh, bass player, co-writer of Jeopardy, uh, and unfortunately passed away in 2017. Mm-hmm. And then guitars, you have uh, some some great guitar players, Greg Douglas from Steve Miller Band, Jimmy Lyons, and Joe Satriani on four tracks. And that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was a, a pedigree uh, a guitar uh, session for sure. Yeah. So tell me about the singer, though. So Keith England, I don't know a lot about him. I know he did some film and TV work. He worked on that movie, The Rocker with Dwight from The Office. What else has he done? Because this was recorded back in 86, so he must have been known at that point for something. Somewhat known. He was, uh, he, uh, I think, was a background singer for Allman Brothers. Oh, okay. And um, so you and uh, S Steve Wright wrote all the songs together, and so that's why it's kind of your project. And so this, you've got the guitars and the singers. They're kind of more like hired guns in, in this project. That's, that's correct. Uh, we were actually uh, looking to uh, find a guitar player out of various sessions. There were about nine uh, different sessions that we had, uh, a combination of having a, a, a bundle of songs that we had written and, then we, and the pile kept getting bigger. Well, we decided we better lay these things down and see what they really sound like. Uh, and then... Uh, uh, also at the same time looking for, for guitar players. When Joe came in and did the four tracks, uh, it was a, a combination of uh, 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 an audition and uh, uh, a guy there for the session. So we kind of didn't, we didn't know where he was gonna go with the project at that time. Right, and then obviously his solo career has taken off, but I mean, <laughs> <laughs> to put it mildly. Yeah, <laughs> to say the least. But it, what's amazing to me is how good this music is. I mean, it really, it obviously sounds like 80s rock, but it doesn't sound dated or it holds the test of time. It sounds very reminiscent of like a Huey Lewis in the news kind of stuff. I really like it. If you like that kind of music, I think you'll love it. And it's like, it's like finding a treasure to, to hear this because it's new. It's unreleased. No one's ever heard it but it was recorded back then. So why was this never released? Because I feel like at the very least, it could have been used in some TV or film soundtracks or something. Well, uh, that's exactly what I'm trying to do now. Um, uh, the idea was to get the, the songs that we had written recorded and, and we were trying to get a deal based on, on the songs. But in those days, uh, uh, people, labels, 
uh, want to hear the band meet you and and that means you got to be out playing gigs mm. and, and you, you, you that's what you do uh unfortunately steve didn't want to do gigs so that mm. kind of took that that uh, uh part of the puzzle out and uh things you know went along and we didn't get a, a deal and eventually you know the whole thing just sort of uh dissipated and uh uh, I, the the guy that in, we ended up with as a guitarist was Greg Douglas, and uh, and he, he you know he's a, they're all great players and all great uh, people, and, uh, and and what I remember uh, about Joe was you know I mean, we said what do you think uh, you think you'd like to be part part of this band after we had done the the session work. And uh, he said, no, I'm going to do a uh, 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 heavy metal uh, instrumental uh, album. And we looked at each other and said, good luck with that, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> but it, yeah, it worked out. for. And about, and about that time, uh, you know, an alien came by on a surfboard. So, uh, yeah, that yeah. was really cool. So I looked at the credits, who pl but who played the horn on? I think the song was called Real Love. There, I, was that a keyboard or was that a real horn? That was a keyboard. Oh, okay. It sounds. It fooled me. I thought it was a real saxophone. Pat Mosca played it, uh, uh, or or uh, uh, Timmy uh, uh, Goodman played it. I'm not really sure. Which, we had okay. two two guys that might have done it. So did the key? Yeah. So and then now you're going to release this on your own record label. So how do you get your own record label? Like, could I start a record label, Chuck Shoot Records? How do I do that? Well. Uh, Yes and no. Um, I, I made a deal with uh, uh, Sony Orchard as a distributor. So I mm. have Sony, the power of Sony. You need, you really do need the pow power of, of, of a label and the things that it brings. I released a solo album a year ago, right when the pandemic hit, and it was on CD Baby. And they, you know, that's, that's an independent label, but they have no... Uh, 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 room to promote they don't they they actually don't do that they do a lot less than they they used to do and so you need uh the power of, of a label and uh, and but at the same time you know record companies can be the artist's nemesis you know the you got to watch them you got to audit sure. them all the time. that's what we do with credence clearwater revival to this day we we, we audit the label uh, o o over 53 years and uh, there's always money there and whose money is it it's our money but we have to pay money to get to get our money it, it, that's huh. show business that's the record industry so um uh, what he does, uh, what uh, Bob Frank does, his company at Sony Orchard, they're a, they're a distributor through a major label. And so uh, I said, well, uh, what, are, what are most of your artists doing? So most of our artists are doing their own label mm -hmm. and then we're distributing it. Said, okay. Sign me up. You know, this is, <laughs> this is great. And the thing about it is that all the songs that are recorded on, on my label, uh, I'm the writer of, or co-writer of. So it's like a, a, a publishing uh, driven label. Oh. This, this project with, uh, with Steve Wright and the cast of, of, of many guitar players uh, is uh, uh, just a, a, a bit of fortune. And the, the, the same thing happened with my solo album. We recorded it and I uh, didn't, didn't get any action on, from labels and other things came up. I got involved in a civic project uh, mm -hmm. uh, dealing with uh, uh, defensible space, forest fires and wildfires. And I got really involved in it and it became the number one program in the nation so deemed by the Department of Agriculture. And, uh, and I found myself dealing with politicians uh, all, 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 anyone that was, was a property owner in, in the ta Lake Tahoe Basin. And uh, it was quite a, quite a, a, a different uh, 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 project for me. And I mean, normally I'm, uh, there's music involved. There was no music involved. <laughs> no. Probably, probably the best thing I ever did. And the pro oh. uh, that project is still alive and, and facing the uh, uh, conditions uh, as I look out the window at a, at a, at a drought uh, situation uh, uh, 
we have to really watch out. Uh, we're in a red flag uh, fire uh, situation today as uh -huh. we speak. Well, that's, anyway, that's, yeah, that's very important work. And I, I'm glad that you're doing it. And uh, somebody needs to do, it. I wouldn't want to deal with the politicians personally, but I'm glad that there's somebody out there that can take care of that for us. Well, you know what, I'll tell you what, rock and roll does a lot of good things. Sometimes, you know, uh, most of them, most of them uh, said, you know, that they were Creedence fans and they, they wanted to talk to me about that. I wanted to talk to them about the defensible space. So there you I, go. You know, through a few stories out there, a couple of Woodstock things and other things that, that we were involved in. And then once I had them sitting there drooling, then I hit them. This is what I <laughs> to do. That's awesome. Well, you've had such an amazing career and you've, you've really achieved a lot of your dreams. And I, I wrote this quote down because I liked it so much. You said, believe in your dreams because, you know, you've been in the middle of the, your dreams and they do, they turn out bigger than the dream imagined. And if you have a dream, you have to be totally committed be totally passionate. Give 110% your heart and your head. You can sit around and wait for it to come, but it ain't going to happen. You got to make it happen. And I love that because it might sound a little bit cliched, but I think it has more credence, no pun intended, because it comes from you and you had this success. Well, you know, I've had two, uh, working on three uh, dreams come true. The first one was, of course, 13 year olds having uh, uh, put together Creedence Clearwater Revival. It took us 10 years before we had our first hit, but that was the, the big, the, re the real big dream. And from that, uh, Creedence Clearwater Revisited, Stu Cook and I had that project for 25 years. We just retired from touring. Uh, my, my body is saying no moss and I have uh, Parkinson's and uh, I, don't, uh, I can still play, but I don't wanna be in a, in a situation where I'm on stage playing one of our uh, hits and then uh, Parkinson says, I think I'm going to screw you now. Oh. Uh, yeah, so you, you, I, I had to get involved in something that uh, didn't require me playing uh, uh, drums for, for a, a living. And, and now I'm doing a, my own label. Yeah. Working with my own song. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty cool thing. It's a, uh, so this is the, the third one, and and it hasn't it hasn't manifested itself yet. Okay. Uh, but I'm hoping you know with a lot of hard work and 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 good songs, I you know I've been able to put myself together with uh, talented people all my career. That's another secret. Secret, you know, surround yourself with good pe good people, nice people, and uh, talented people, and. Uh, uh, and then you, you throw what you have into the pot and, and uh, you know, usually good things will happen. So right now we're uh, right, just open the door to go down this new path, but I'm very excited about it. And uh, I've, I've got a pretty good team of people uh, behind me. So you say that with your new label, it's going to be you projects that you uh, are co-writing. Are you going to take on some younger bands or are you mentoring any uh, younger musicians or anything like that? Well, you know, I don't want to put the cart in front of the horse. Uh, right now, I've I've got an album uh, coming out. The singles uh, just was released yesterday. Hmm. Uh, so this is you know uh, this is the first one, and I've got to you know I've I've got to get get some uh, experience under my feet doing what I'm doing, and uh, I've I've got a plan to uh, you know use songs. I've got stuff I've. I've written with Bobby Whitlock. I've got some uh, other people that I've written with. Th th those things will be coming down the line. So to uh, jump out and start th thinking about younger artists and this, and that, I, I'm deviating from my, my, my focus. Uh, I, I've got to concentrate on what I'm doing right now uh, and put all my effort into it and, and not have anything in, in, in the way that, that might uh, uh, mi minimize my my full uh, and, and complete attention. So, uh, who knows? Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe that might. Ha let's see what ha let's see what happens first. Okay. One step at a time, and uh, you know, if I have success and I and and I, I meet somebody out there and uh, uh, and who's a, a young artist and, and a good one, well, I might want to put them on the on the label. But uh, right now, I, I, I I've got to you know. Uh, you take One thing time, at a time. Yeah. You can do your, your best, uh, best work for sure. So we talk about credence and, um, like, like you said, you started the band when you were 13 and went through some name changes, but 
Um, your goal was just to get the songs on the radio, which of course you you did. But I thought this was funny that you guys were so influenced by the Beatles. You went to the store and you bought these Beatles wigs, but it turns out there were Three Stooges wigs. <laughs> well, I hate to admit it, but yes, they were Three Stooges wigs. <laughs> <laughs> and, and at the time we were a trio, uh, Tom hadn't entered, entered the picture yet. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, but we, we, we thought we almost looked like him. So, uh, you know, it was worth the dollar that we spent on him. And in, in those days you could almost buy a car with a dollar. So, oh, geez. <laughs> yeah. And then, so explain this. So you guys, again, you went through some, uh, name changes and stuff. And then, um, obviously the war happened. So John goes into the army and you went into the coast guard and yes. explain this story, man. I heard you telling this. I was. Uh, I just wanted to hear this again and follow up on this. It was a thing like if you could play football, you wouldn't have to go to Vietnam. So, and you never played football, but you decided I'm going to learn how to play football. It, 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 tell the tell my audience the story. I thought this was fascinating. Well, uh, I was uh, going to San Jose State at the time, and, a, and a, a fellow from my hometown, El Cerrito, was a senior, and he was a, a big athlete, six four, two forty, baseball player. And uh, he was in the Coast Guard Reserve, and I had gotten my uh, letter from the, the draft people that I had taken my physical and I passed. Well, I'm, you know, I'm 20 years old. I, of course I passed. And I'd always worked out, and I was a pretty good athlete. I played one, one year of football in high school. Oh, okay. You uh, did play one year. I did play one, one year and got the basics going. But uh, uh, I, I said, Gee, can you get me into the Coast Guard? I asked my, my friend, he says, I'm in the Coast Guard, but I can't get anybody in. You know, it's, 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 there's a, probably a three-year waiting list to get in. It's, it would be, it's the best duty you could have. Plus, the, it was in Alameda. The, uh, the, uh, the boot camp was in Alameda, and that was like less than 10 miles from my house. So oh. pretty, pretty cool. So anyway, make a long story short, he, he took me to, to the coach, the, the baseball coach, who was also the football coach and, and the, the athletic director, and told him a bunch of lies about how great a football player I was. <laughs> and I'd be in varsity at San Jose State the, in, the, the, in the next football season. And the, the, the guy said, okay, great. So they swore me in right there on, the, on the spot. Wow. Head sw swirling around and I'm listening. First of all, I didn't like the, I didn't like lying. Well, I, I wasn't lying directly. My friend was t telling all these lies about me and I was sat sitting there. And so, uh, they, they, I'm in now I'm in. And so I just tear up the, 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 the letter of acceptance from who, the army, I guess it would, would have been, I would have gone to Vietnam. I wouldn't have been in the reserves. I would have been in the regular army. I would have been over there. And so, um, uh, I started thinking about it. My conscience started, you know, working on me. So I started working out as if I was going to be playing football because I had two months to get ready. And I, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm little, but I, I probably had 4% body fat back then. I was always very strong and, and very fast and a, and a good athlete. So uh, one of the, the things that he did tell me, he said, whatever you do, don't play, don't go out and play football in, in the military. He says, I've seen w what these guys do. He says, it's a brass knuckles league, mm. literally. These guys, bam, things into the, you know, brass knuckles, and then they'll tape their hands over, around. He, he says, wow. And you, your little fart, you know, <laughs> you, you'll be killed. And I said, well, I'll be killed if I go to Vietnam. So how Good about point. That? Yeah. So uh, went out and uh, uh, got injured uh, right off the bat. And uh, uh, he was right about even your own teammates are, <laughs> are, are, don't like you, and, you know, it's until, you're, until you're playing somebody, uh, you know, from on the other side. So anyway, I got, I got, I got better. And he's I'm competing against college athletes. That was what the coach did talked to coaches all over and said, you have somebody on the military bubble, I can get them in the re reserves. They'll miss one season of football, but they'll play football. So they won't, you know, be fat and sloppy when they roll in, mm. but 
but and here's the the kicker the, they'll play but it won't count against their eligibility because it's not a p- part of a university ah, situation so I think interesting had a great scheme but the competition was now i'm playing against college athletes these are guys that have played all the, their high school years and been playing at a at the college level so i'm I'm kind of going, hmm, and I, I got hurt pretty pretty early on in the program before our first game. So long story short, short, if I can, it's impossible with me. <laughs> uh, 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 I uh, uh, got got well, and uh, one of, one of the guys got hurt, and they they put me in. And the first thing I do is I go out there and I intercept the pass and run it back inside the five yard line. And we ended up scoring a touchdown. Now I've, I've played one series uh, and I've already made an inter- interception and brought it back almost into, into the end zone. So, uh, and then uh, because I had speed, I was in special teams the outside contain, which is means you're, you're fast. I was the fastest guy on the defense. So uh, then I, I, I ended up being uh, the, leading the league in, in inter- interceptions. I was pretty darn good at picking them off. And then also good at run support. I could close in on a, on a, on a running back and, and, and put a pretty good hit on him. Part of the deal, too, is I'm going through boot camp uh, and, and boot camp is hell. You're getting picked on, pushed around, and they let you off uh, the island on, on on Friday to go play somebody that you that you don't like. Yeah. And, mm, now now I'm a now I am a brass knuckles guy. Now you're the guy. Okay. And then didn't you guys win the national championship or something like that? We we won the the the, the championship. It wasn't a national thing on a national level. It was a it was a regional thing uh, on the West Coast. Okay, we we were undefeated. We were an undefeated uh, team. I think the team went on at, to win forty five straight games. I only played in in the ones that uh, uh, during my active duty, which was six months. Okay, and, and then you know you're in the reserves. Then you go once a month, and then two weeks in the summer. So that's how I did it. I you know and and it was and I loved it. And I tell you the truth. Uh, hmm. I thought for sure I was going to get hurt. I did get hurt, but not enough to, to, to knock me out. And I made good on, on, uh, what I, you know, my, my contribution to the team. I Absolutely. One of the team leaders. So, uh, Hey, 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 rock and roll and football. That's amazing story. I think that's so inspirational, but then, so obviously you get out of the, uh, the military, the band gets back together you guys go on to have all the success. And and this was so, I never realized this, that, you know, your first three albums, or I don't know if it's, it's those three albums in a row. I don't know if it's the first, there might be one before that, but 1969, there's three albums released in the same year. And that was apparently John's idea because he said, if we're ever off the charts, we'll be forgotten. So how yep. stressful was that having to make three albums in a year? I've, I've never heard of that. Well, it, 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 that that was the, the what we had. That was what we had to do. That was the plan. That's how, how he wanted it, and I I, I disagreed with it. Uh, but uh, you know, we were making records, so uh, it wasn't like we were shoveling horse shit. You know, so <laughs> or maybe elephant shit. There's a joke about that. And the, the the guy that's in the in the circus and the, he's at the back of the parade and he was shoveling the the elephant shit off the street and somebody came up behind him and said hey why don't you get out of, uh, another job and he says what get out of show business <laughs> that's that's true so yeah it's- little little, little uh, uh, show business humor yeah. Did you guys not do any shows that year or did you do a few? Oh, we, we toured behind each, each album. Wow. That is amazing that you were able to yeah. put all that stuff out. And um, it's interesting too, that you, you guys top so many charts, you have so many hits, but I don't know if people know this. You never hit number one. You had the distinction of having five number two singles. Did that bother you or anyone else in the group? Well, it bothered us. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it bothered us. We had number one albums. We had two number one albums, Green River and Cosmos Factory, but we never had a number one single and it bothered the hell out of us. And, uh, but this, I think uh, uh, this, the, uh, we had s- several double-sided hits. So when you're splitting uh, 
the the the, the two records for one uh, that, that that changes the the, the numbers. Uh, so I I think that's why we had the number two singles. Mm, okay. And also, Saul Zenz didn't uh, like the trade papers, called them blood sucking, and I won't, you know, I don't want to be beep beeped out, but uh, you can swear on this, one. I don't care, but yeah. Okay, they called they they called Saul and said, you know, you got the number one band in the in the land. Uh, why don't you t take out? A, why aren't you taking out any ads? He says, all you guys are is blood sucking fuckers. I wouldn't put a, a dime into one of your rags. So I think that also helped us get get the number two spots. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So did, what was your relationship like with Saul? Because I'm just you know I'm learning I'm reading about the band and the history and all that and. Uh... Obviously, him and John didn't get along. What What was your take on the manager? Well, the manager was was John. And oh, uh, sorry, Saul was the record guy, right? The re yeah, the yeah. owner of Fantasy Records or the executive. Yeah, he was the owner. John, we did we we needed a real manager, or none of right. that would have happened. And John didn't know anything about business, but, but he was a control freak, and he had to he had to be the manager, and he did a terrible job. I think he would admit that now, huh. uh, and uh, that's why we had, yeah, you know, uh, ended up with uh, the same deal we had when we our parents co-signed uh, because we weren't uh, old enough. But it was, in other words, a, a, a terrible deal for a, a band that was number one in the world because John didn't like what was didn't found out he didn't own his songs, and and so that was his focus, not getting us a new artist deal, which was was our focus and, and, and his as well. He, he, you know, he, he, he would share in, in that. So we ended up with, uh, with, with him in, in a, in a battle of hatred. I mean, he hated the man and, and, uh, and, and did things like we went, went to, to meetings with like the great escape with, uh, uh, Steve, uh, who's the actor? Anyway, throwing the baseball up against the wall. John did things like that in, in business meetings. And said, I'm going to think, gee, that's showing them. <laughs> what are you doing? So huh. we had those fights with John. We need a manager. And also the other fight was you, you, Tom needs to be able to sing at least a song. We did cover songs. You know, John, it was Tom that br brought us in when we were 13. It was Tom that kept us going when and, and, and bought studio time for us. Uh, without without Tom, there would have been no no credence. I wouldn't be talking to you. And but John wouldn't let him do anything. And and he when he used to do everything. He was the singer, the band leader, all of that. And he just treated him pretty pretty shabbily. And uh, so we, Stu and I uh, and Tom were always fighting for t for Tom, and and ultimately he left. So uh, that's just a, a, a control uh, freak thing that uh, John had. Now John, as an artist, hats off to him, and and uh, you know, I, no one's going to disagree with that. Yeah, no one's going to disagree with that. That wasn't that wasn't the problem. But he was a terrible manager, and and it would have been a lot. Uh, uh, easier and he would probably would have gotten his songs songs back and, and I'm, I'm sure we would have gotten a, a, a real record deal but that's just that's just how it went down the good news is is the real legacy the, the one that counts is that we have this wonderful uh uh, uh bunch of uh, uh, music that uh, we recorded and and is is still being played on the radio 53 years later yeah original original wish that yeah uh, you, again you totally exceeded that so besides and besides all that music you have you, there's got to be some mem some good memories too right and uh oh, sure. like tell me about some of the times like you toured this is a, i never heard this story you guys actually toured with tina turner when when she first did your song proud mary in uh the first time was in utah with a with like a suit and tie crowd this sounds fascinating to me literally suit and tie and uh, and and a lot of blonde hairs, uh, you know. Uh, and uh, Tina did this, did this, the her version of Proud Mary. She's giving head to the microphone. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what. 
I was I was sweating on this island. <laughs> in Utah. I mean, this is like back oh, in the Yeah. Yeah. But she yeah, killed it, right? She I mean oh, that she the song, her version is amazing. Oh, it's, it's, it just makes us look like old men. <laughs> <laughs> With, with the with the tempo that they had it at and the, and the yeah. horns, and I mean, wow! But we invited the, we we were doing eight shows with Ike and Tina Turner uh, on this tour, the tour. So we had them for eight shows, and after the first night, we invited the the, the band uh, to to one of our suites for a, a party to you know get to know each other and and uh, etc. So. We're, we were looking for Tina and we, and we came up to one of the eye cats and we said, where's Tina? He said, she, they said, she, she's, she's, oh, she's got beefsteak on her, on her face. I said, what do you mean she got beefsteak on her face? She says, Ike's beating her up. Ugh. And, uh, and uh, whoa, you know, so we're going, wait a minute, you know, this is, this is not acceptable behavior. So uh, we, uh, I, I believe, believe we, uh, I, I forget who, who talked to him. I, I might have been some, Tom Hewitt or somebody from Concerts West, you know, and that, that, that's just, I just says, well, that, that's none of your business and, and that's a lie anyway and blah, blah, blah. And so the next, next night, uh, I comes up and, uh, and we're watching, just to, looking at Tina, seeing if we see any visual uh, m marks on her. And uh, I gets up and he says, this is a, a new one, my a new song that I, I just I just wrote. And it was a flat lift. Of, <laughs> I'm born in the buyer, one of them. I mean, just a straight lift, just a steal. And, and, and John said, that's it, you know. So okay. we kicked him up. We we I don't I don't I don't remember who who filled in their, their spot, but we 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 kicked them off off the tour. Yeah, so that's one that you did, and then you guys played Woodstock, and this yeah. this is an interesting story too because Grateful Dead went on right before you guys, but apparently they took LSD, and it was just a total mess. And yeah. uh, tell that story. What that's that's a crazy one. I've I've got a two, an, another story that connects into all of this. Okay. When uh, uh, the, the the guys that put put it on Woodstock were amateur uh, t promoters, they had done some shows, but nothing like what was about to happen. And I think it was supposed to be like fifty thousand people that were supposed to be there, or maybe ten thousand. I don't remember, but it was wasn't what it ended up being. And so uh, uh, all the big acts, uh, you know, all that that had managers and and you know like the who and uh, all the uh, the big acts that, that played there jimmy hendrix and et cetera et cetera they were all on the sidelines because they're they you know they liked the idea but they were they were, didn't like the idea of going in w with managers they didn't want it to to, to be a a, a, a non-success oh. So uh, everybody's waiting on the on the outside. At that time, we were number one in the world in record sales, number one in the world in, as a concert draw. So we're number one, we're literally number one. And so we liked the idea of what they were going to do. And and uh, th th this one really surprised me. That John said, "Well, let's give them a chance." And I went, wow, that doesn't sound like you, but yeah, that's I. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> that was a that was a good thing. Yeah. And so the second word got out, Credence just jumped in. All the other bands came in. Now, mm. the other ca uh, other ca uh, scenario. What happens if Credence says no? We're not doing it. Would there have been a Woodstock? I don't think so. Wow. I don't there, I don't think enough people would have, uh, you know, of the big big shots, would have would have gone if any, would have gone into it. So, there's that story. Then there's the Grateful Dead story, and, and, and John really didn't like them anyway. And uh, 
just didn't think they were very good because of the conditions that they were in when they played. They may have been brilliant musicians, but they, you know, they were taking LSD and playing music. Yeah, didn't they do like a 45 minute version of a song just jamming for, and that's a long time. Yeah. 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 And we, we, we were, and when we went, when to finish up the other side of that story, uh, we were, we were the headliners. Right. We were in the headliner spot on Saturday night, and we were supposed to be on at, I don't know, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, uh, but we were the headliners, and these guys came out and played and played and played and played, and that's what they did, and they, you know, and there was also rain. I think that affected everybody. There was electronic problems, rain mm-hmm. and electronics, not a good thing. Live microphones and rain, not good. Electrocution it could be... Uh, part of that so anyway that's uh, that's our woodstock story i don't know how we got in and i don't know how we got out and I, <laughs> you know we, we were we were sober so i mean it, it, i i know how i got in i got in on a helicopter and got out on a farm boy that had uh, snow tires and went on the dirt roads oh. but i don't know how our, our crew got in and i don't know how the, the gear got in right well, and you guys, didn't you make a pact after seeing Grateful Dead at that show? You said, okay, we're never going to get drunk or high on stage. We don't want to be this. We don't want to be like that. No, we didn't do it then. We did it before oh. we had a hit. It was before we that went, even. Wow. Yeah, we, we went to the Fillmore to see the local bands. It was the, the Dead and the Quicksilver Messenger Service and the Je- Jefferson Airplane. Hmm. And we wanted to see what, what those guys were doing. And, and so... Uh, you know, we were broke, but we we managed to have, get three bucks each to go in and, and see what the you know what the, what the big local bands were doing, and th- they were doing that. They were taking acid and playing. <laughs> they were terrible, you know. weren't in time and tune, and it's just you know. But you know, to, to me, the Dead uh, were they were more of a cult than a, than a, than a, a musical. Uh, a band so you know and their followers were all stone and it was to me that's what what the, that that thing was all about and so that's that's how they did did what they did you know i'm i'm not here to judge them i i've, I've known some of the some of the guys and met some of the guys and they're nice people so you know I, uh, yeah the, they, they did their thing and we we, we went the exact opposite it right all about music <laughs> We, we rehearsed every day, uh, and it was then on the floor of the Fillmore Auditorium we put our hands t- together and said, we will never play high on anything. No no alcohol, no no drugs, ever. Not not just at the, at the show, but every day at work. Anything to do with business, we did straight. Finally, I, I said, we have to have beers in the, dress, in, in the dressing room after a show. After, yeah, that makes sense for sure. And and, and that passed. So, yeah. yeah. So then another one that you did that was memorable. This is really cool because you grew up. You saw Elvis Presley on the Ed Sullivan Show. You saw oh, the Beatles, yeah. and then you get to play the Ed Sullivan Show. So, what do you remember about that one? <laughs> Ed, he had very strange mannerisms, physical mannerisms, and 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 some speech things that were very odd and as it turned out ed was a very shy man and a wonderful man and he did a lot for rock and roll i mean he brought the beatles in he brought the stones in brought us in i mean he you know he really supported rock and roll uh, and and for us you know a square if you will uh he, he he was pretty darn good uh but he, he, he was a very bashful man. And so after dress rehearsal, he would go out and have he, the opposite of, uh, of the pact we made. He'd have 10 to 15 anisets and he was completely shit faced. Oh, and, go. and that's why in and out on our show and then spin around and kind of wobble and, you know, is he going to fall down or, you know, he was hammered. He was, <laughs> you know, hammered. Wow. And here's, listen to this. This is beautiful. We were in the headliner spot. We didn't know it because we didn't have a manager there, you know. And, and the last band, rock band to play was the Stones, and they got drunk and they they took their empty beer cans and filled up a toilet with them and then shit on on top of that. They, they were assholes. Mm-hmm. And uh, we come in and they said, you know, 
and we book 90 minutes worth of time and we can cut you right up to, to, to the show time. So you better not do what the Rolling Stones are and you better your behavior. And we said, we, we don't, we're here to do business. We're here to play the best possible show we can do for our fans and for you, sir. And, uh, and and that was yes sir no sir we were never late we never we didn't swear uh, on the set you know we we're just we're business yeah so uh, they, they they said if, if Ed likes you he'll call you over so they, we finished our our, our our deal and song and walk and he go, he waves us over and we kind of, he says, he likes us he likes us that's, you know that's the our naive you know of course he likes us we're headliners. You know, but and and we we were gentlemen as well, but um, anyway. So he he says, okay. I, after uh, you get a uh, your your conclude your 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 set, I'm gonna have you come over, and I want to ask each one of you a question. So uh, he brought the the cue card guy over, and uh, he got our our names, and we we're as in the order we were standing next to him, and and he wrote a wrote a, a quick question. So he had it all there, and he says, so uh, off he went to start his his uh, drinking, and it was lunchtime, and they made us stay for an hour. We had this funny, crummy little set that's supposed to be. Uh, like a, a boat dock in, in, a, in the bayou somewhere. And anyway, oh. we had had to dismount. So we had to dismount in a certain way. Uh, so we would come and line up with the qu- with the questions on the cue cards. And so they they, they had another uh, just somebody a guy standing there who said nothing, but he was on Ed's mark. So you know it was all part of the the rehearsal. So they made us stay for an hour. And do this, and it's a song over. And then we get off and we walk over, and then we walk back and took our positions and so, song over. And then we come back and do it. We have it, you know, we've got it, but no, we want to make sure. Oh, okay, we didn't complain. So we, after that, then we were really hungry. We went, went and had a, one, a deli sandwich at the, the, the famous deli next door to the Sullivan Theater. And they put us on the fifth floor when there was no elevator, you know, just the highest level. They, they, they didn't treat us like stars because I think the, the, the Rolling Stones uh, did, took care of that. <laughs> so right. now it's showtime. Now it's showtime. And I'll tell you, I've seen the Sullivan show and it's the number one show on television in the world at the time. And it's live. My heart is pounding. You know, I didn't get I, it was the most nervous I've ever been. Uh, wow! Playing, playing a gig because of those sixteen million people or whatever, what thirty million? I don't know what it was. You know, my grandmother's watching. I mean, everybody's watching. So anyway, we get up there and we, we play the set and we walk. Boom, boom, boom. We are in perfect order. We walk over to Ed. Ed's shit face now. He's <laughs> excited. That's great. That's great. And he reaches over and grabs Stu around his, his neck and comes up with, with, with me on under his other arm. We're out of order. Oh. So he says, well, well, Stu. And I said, no, I'm Doug. Oh. He says, oh, Doug. Uh, now he's looking for Doug on the card. And, and we're looking at each other. And we, we, we had to look away because we were going to uh, break out laughing. Wow. And we didn't, we didn't want to do that. And so he, he completely fucked the whole thing up. <laughs> and, and when we came up, he couldn't say Creedence Clearwater. He said, okay, girl, he couldn't say <laughs> oh it. Oh, my he God. Hammered. Wow. That, that's our Ed Sullivan story. That's amazing. That's, yeah, I, I didn't think yeah. I ever knew that, that he was a big drunk. I, I, I didn't uh, know. Oh, yeah, he got a DUI, and uh, we played again that year, and he was straight and sober and oh. a completely different personality. Huh. Yeah. He, okay. He, yeah, so he straightened himself out. Were there any other uh, memorable shows uh, that you that stand out to you with the original Creedence Clearwater revival? Well, yeah, and it's uh, soon to be a, 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 an, an album, uh, a DVD, actually, uh, Royal Albert Hall. Hmm. And that's you know we went for our first time in Europe to Europe, and and the and uh, it's like it was a, like a reversal. It was like when the Beatles came over to the, to America their first time. And uh, the, uh, the 
course, the effect that they had on, on, on America was far greater than the effect we had when we went to Europe. But we were the number one band in the land at that time. And uh, uh, so uh, it was a pretty big deal. And uh, a couple of the Beatles were in the audience and uh, I, I, I was told and uh, I was pretty I was pretty excited about it. And, and so that's coming out. And our shows were only 50 minutes long. Oh, you know, John couldn't do what he did with with his voice uh, doing an hour, hour and a half shows. We wouldn't have been able to do the tours we did. Uh, that's just, you know, because uh, that's hamburger after a while with the with the power that he had and the, and the style of his, his singing style. So it's a good thing that we did 50 minute shows because they, they were all, uh, you know, right in his wheelhouse and it, it made, it just made sense. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, then obviously, you know, the band breaks up and then, you know, life goes on, but you know, obviously your music is, is everywhere. It's, you know, I can't see a war of with uh, or a movie with about Vietnam that, you know, you don't hear fortunate son. And then, you know, a lot of the music was licensed to like commercials and things like a Wrangler jeans commercial and paint thinner and all these random things. And that obviously bothered John. Did that, what was your take on that? Did it bother you to see your, your guys's music in these things that maybe you didn't really approve of, or did you care? I, I, I thought it was a, a good thing because, uh, television is, uh, is, is, is huge and, and mm -hmm. it's the kind of audience that you were exposed to that we never would be exposed to uh, if we were playing a show or you know because it would be a, a certain group of people television is everybody the, and so it helps to, to keep your music going this is after we broke up right John was just telling people to boycott credence and that's oh yeah he wouldn't play the songs and he got up and made, you know, I got screwed. So don't buy anything, any fantasy records, including Credence. And uh, so that, the, the you know, the, that uh, I was really glad to see those things come in. Not only that, but, you know, you get paid for it. Sure. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. Now, you know, it's, it's a, he's changed his mind about all of those things uh, because his wife's managing and so it makes a difference. She, mm. she knows that, that it's show business and, and, uh, and I think that's a, that's a good, it's good for everybody. It's good for him. It's good for us. So, uh, you know, I, I, th I think it, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. In fact, there's a, 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 a the, the, uh, what's the big, uh, superhero uh the, the former wrestler there's a book. the rock rock yeah the rock he's in a movie now this uh, about the jungle and they were using run through the jungle uh, in that's the trailer song. but only in the trailer and now okay you know, so and that's a new thing that they that it's come up where they'll use a song that uh, people will stop what they're doing and, and, and take a listen and credence has that kind of power and so they they they'll uh, do a thirty or a, like a six week deal where they'll use our, our record during the trailer, but it's not in in the in the film where it would cost him a couple hundred grand. Oh, it's okay. A different, different deal. So they use it as a as a uh, marketing t uh, tool to uh, you know doesn't mean it's going to be in in the in the movie. In most cases nowadays, it's not. Okay. So where do you think things went south? I, I want to talk a little bit about the feud with John, uh, just for a couple of reasons. One, I want to clear up some of the confusion about some of the things, and I want to get your side of the story. And two, I have a lot of younger musicians who listen to the show, and I think they can learn from this. And then three, I'm just, it's just my own selfish curiosity. But where do you think things started to go south? Because obviously when you guys were the gollywogs or whatever, I don't, I'm assuming that you guys probably got along okay back then. When did things start to turn, in your opinion? Once we had a hit record, uh, things 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 changed, and uh, you know we 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 could have really used a manager. And and, to, and John has admitted in in a book that uh, uh, Joe Smith wrote a long time ago, long time ago, that it would have been better if we would have had a manager. You know, somebody that uh, we, we we needed a mentor because. Mm -hmm. Uh, a father figure because we had brothers that were at odds and the older brother 
as taking all the shit from the younger brother. And, uh, and you know, and if, if that, that was all smooth and we're running smoothly, there, there wouldn't have been any problems because we would have a manager going after, uh, keeping his eye on, on the, the record company, auditing, doing all the things you need to do, negotiating a new deal, all those, all the business things that were needed, but the, probably the most important thing that, that that person could do would be to, to mentor, uh, especially the, you know, the brothers to, to make sure that, that, that what happened to Tom would not have happened to Tom. And that, that you know, the, the Beatles that had everybody sing, you know, but Tom had a, had a tenor like John did, but with, but with the exception, it was a, it was a, soft tenor like a richie valens tenor and we did a lot of covers as i say and uh, he we, he could have done la bamba in fact uh, we used to pitch that you know let him let him do la bamba you know it's a it's a, it's a worthy co cover song and uh, tom used to sing it when he when he when he had his band and you know just did a good job i'm thinking uh, that if he, that happened and he had a hit with it that John feared that there, that would somehow threaten his authority. That's so what, that's what I think. Is this, I read this and I, it seems really muddy on this part where it's at one point, John said that he he did kind of an about face and he informed that, uh, that you cook, uh, you and him and cook would, uh, uh, adopt by a democratic approach that each member would now write and perform his own material with each member contributing three songs and he would only contribute the guitar parts. Is, is there truth to that? Or, or did, did you like that? Or what was the story about that? It's truth. And it wasn't a democratic thing. It was, it was a, a, an ultimatum. And uh, he said, if we don't do it that way, we break up right now. Hmm. So what he was, if we would have uh, had our thinking caps on, we thought, okay, we'll do it, and, and, and uh, it won't be the best. And but we'll then we'll go back, and he'll see I told you, and then we'll go back to the way that we did business. Well, we were being set up, and he told everybody that we made him do that. We forced him to 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 do that. It's, that's a that's that's a, just a lie. That's not what we wanted. And that it, it, it's not something that he would have said yes to. It would have been the, the, the he had said no all all along. So because Tom quit, and we had been backing Tom, uh, and, and it was all about uh, you know him singing and being uh, more uh, a, 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 a part of the band, that he made us do the do the the, the three songs each. And uh, and he would only play guitar on he wouldn't play and and he wouldn't play guitar except on my songs because I didn't play guitar <laughs> right he didn't play guitar on on his songs and he's a bass player you know uh, so anyway that, that it was it was a and then he, and then he came out and said that we we for, forced his hand and wanted a, a, a democrat more of a democratic oh, there's nothing democratic about it it was a cold calculated thing that uh, set us up and uh, to take the, you know, selfishly take, take the band down. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't, uh, I don't carry things around like John. He, he, his, his, he has a grudge and it'll, it'll, he'll take it to the grave with me and Stu and, and then with Tom who was in the grave. I mean, the, so he's, when, when you know, when, when he has a grudge, it's it's a life, it's a life sentence. So did he never try to uh, fix things with Tom? Because Tom, uh, you know, obviously he got the. the he did, but he, he did when Tom was dying, and I was there because I was. Oh, you were there. Doing a, uh, a, 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 Tom had AIDS, so he was, and that's when it was the Black Plague. Nobody knew really what it was, mm -hmm. and he couldn't. He needed to be in. Uh, uh, intensive care, but uh, his insurance wouldn't cover it. So uh, his son Jeff and I would come for a week, and I would do a 12-hour shift in, in his room. Uh, and you know, if you needed water or needed help to get up to go to the bathroom, whatever, 
and just to be there and talk and uh, and that helped let his wife t take care of her little girls and get them to, to school, pick them up from school. And then Jeff would spend the, the do the overnight thing. And sometimes I do the overnight thing, but the two of us would uh, would uh, be uh, do do the the, the nursing uh, duties uh, because otherwise uh, John would have been by himself. He, you just couldn't do that. But uh, you know, he, he he said John said so, Saul is his best friend. Tom wanted to to play. Uh, get the band together with acoustic guitars and play together and, and, and make peace that way with all of us at the same time. And John didn't, didn't, didn't want to do that and made himself uh, unavailable uh, as he was doing his trip to, to the blues, uh, you know, uh, the great blues artist uh, of, of the era. And uh, but when when Tom couldn't couldn't hold a guitar, he was so sick he couldn't hold a guitar. Then he came, and and went in the, and talked talked to to John or talked to Tom. And I went I left the room, left him privacy. And then when I, I went in in the room, Tom had tears coming down his face, and he said he said John said he'll play with us now. That one gets me to this day, but uh, he, you know, and he said that he tried to make make amends. John said he tried to make friends with uh, his brother, but his brother said Saul Zenz is my best friend. He said so that that ruined it. It's not what what happened in there, and I really don't want to you know talk about that that or him anymore. Uh -huh. uh, I'm trying to do something and and. and uh, and in, in uh, my uh, uh, waning years, as I'm, I'm 76 years old, I'm starting a new phase uh, where I'm, I'm not going to be playing live shows. And I, I have my own record label uh, now, and uh, uh, and it's uh, uh, just a great opportunity to put out songs that I've, I'm a writer on or a co-writer co or a writer on. So it's like a publishing company that has is a label, and it's distributed by Sony Orchard, so right. the, the big distributor. And uh, the the song, the uh, the uh, album is uh, for all the money in the world, uh, and that's the the first song on on, on the album. And uh, this uh, and it's uh, Clifford Wright is the project, and as I said earlier. The, the the other writer of the music, the co-writer, my 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 co-conspirator, uh, Steve Wright, has passed uh, away uh, in uh, 2017. So it's his last, uh, uh, and he's a great bass player. Yeah, uh, and a songwriter. The songs, like I said, yeah. the songs are so good. Now, do I forget? Do we have an actual uh, official date when this comes out? Yes. Uh, the single came uh, for, for all the money in the world came out yesterday. Okay, as a single, and th then there's another single coming on the third of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, August, and then the album will be out on August 27th. But if you go to the site where the single is, and if you get the single, then you can you can uh, 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 get get the album. Okay, and and uh, and or or listen to it. I'm not exactly sure if you can get it, but uh, you can hold it for for sure. You can hold it, and and or hopefully you'll be able to hear the whole thing. And and uh, yeah, because I heard the whole thing. Uh, your publicist sent it to me, and it, it's like oh. I said, it sounds it's like a stamp in time, but it's a good stamp in time. I mean, it sounds like classic '80s pop rock music. If you like Huey Lewis, that kind of stuff. It's really high caliber, I, I think. Well, you know, uh, people say that, and I had a solo album as well. From and these are thirty-five-year-old songs. Uh, they were they were written way back and mm -hmm. then recorded and then put away in in a in a, in a, in a vault. You know, I call it Cosmo's vault, uh, and, uh, and and uh, and they they. they Passed the test of time, and mm -hmm. we bake them. there's a, a procedure that you do where you bake them, 
and uh, and if they're because you know they they are very delicate things, and if they pass the baking baking test, then you'll be able to to, to take that that and run it to digital, and then you you then it, it's good, uh, and and, you, and you'll be able to keep it. So the when it, we recorded those those records, uh, they, they lasted all that time. In, in the in the vault and uh, it's amazing yeah yeah and i i think there are some hits in there uh, uh, uh quite honestly uh I don't mean to I'm, I'm not trying to brag or anything i'm just telling the, what what i hear and uh, i've got a pretty educated ear and then what people tell me uh, about it and uh, and that it doesn't sound like something from from that era you know it's, it's not something they put it on they go oh that's from 1985 uh, it has a freshness about it and uh you know and, and it's that's... timeless really good music is timeless i think i mean credence clearwater revival today sounds just as good if not better than it did then and so i think the same with this project i think it's great yeah well thanks i i hope the, the world agrees with you i'd love to uh, get it out for so many reasons, you know. Uh, uh, great and and it's so, so great to have people to be able to hear Steve Wright as a bass player. Uh, uh, he's uh, he's really he's really good, and uh, so we have that. That's our rhythm section. We have the those great guitarists. As, yeah, as mentioned uh, the keyboard guys are terrific. Uh, and then uh, uh, Keith England, the singer, just did a hell of a job. Uh, he was very young at the time. He was in his mid twenties, I think. Mm. And uh, he he listened and took took uh, took uh, uh, direction well. Had didn't have an ego. Was eager to to do his best work. And and he really made those songs. Uh, uh, gave him that 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 special touch. You know, really proud of him, and uh, that's another reason I'd like to see success. Is, uh, everybody else that that played in that have been in bands that have platinum records, and uh, Keith is, is is the only one that that didn't, and uh, he's he's got as much talent as anybody on, on the, the record. And I'd love to see, and he's still been, you know, he's still trying to do it. Yeah. So those years, I'd love to see him. And be able to you know, put a put a platinum or gold record on his wall. Yeah, he, he really deserves it. That would be that would be great. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I like to end each episode with a charity. I think your publicist said uh, you you like to promote the juvenile diabetes research uh, charity. Yeah. So yes, I Creedence uh, Clearwater Revisited did it. Uh, there was a, an album out called uh, uh, Hope for the Holidays, and several bands around. Uh, here uh, played a Christmas song, and we did uh, "Run Rudolph Run" by Chuck Berry, uh, and uh, we did it live to two track and uh, the uh, the old fashioned way, and and uh, yeah, that's uh, they they're doing good work. Uh, uh, diabetes is a is a horrible disease, and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, type one is is the, is the mo uh, most brutal of. of of the two there's type one and type two for sure so it's uh, nice stuff yeah i've promoted them before i'll put the link in the notes along with uh, your website so people can f find your music and uh, follow you and and keep up with what everything else you're doing sounds like there's more stuff on the way so i'm excited there, there is more stuff on the way and and, and a, little, a little something for, uh, for john he's uh, he's playing now with his uh, his uh, his uh, some of his children and I think that that's a, a, a real good thing that he's doing and uh, uh, hats off on that. And maybe, uh, you know, he, I'd like to see him be at peace with himself and, 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 and uh, be happy. You know, <laughs> he's, eight, he's 86 too. So, uh, you know, there's not much happy time left. You got to. Right. You know, I wish so that I, for all you guys. Yeah. I mean, I hope you can I make uh, well. peace. I wish him well. And, and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and, I, and I wish Tom was here. Yeah, me too. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate this, and uh, we'll be in touch. Thanks, Chuck. Okay, bye-bye, Doug. Take care now. Doug Clifford, ladies and gentlemen, and what a career he has had thus far. 
and it continues with his new project, Clifford Wright. Uh, the single for all the money in the world is out now. And depending on when you're listening to this episode, the whole album is either coming out soon or it's already out. Uh, and of course, I'm curious about the CCR DVD. Uh, I never got a chance to see them, so that might be fun as well. Uh, make sure to check out Doug's website in the show notes to learn more about what he's up to. And also his charity link is in the show notes as well as my website with all the social media stuff. And as always, your support for the show on social media and YouTube helps me out tremendously and I appreciate it. Uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day. And remember, shoot for the moon. <laughs> <laughs>